All right, so we'll get started. Um, apologies, I'm not sure why the closed captioning isn't working. Um, this is our first time attempting this way to uh, display closed captioning, but we'll give it a, maybe that will come later. Um, but in the meantime, we'll, we'll just get started. So um, hello everyone again. Um, for those who have joined, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat uh, where you're joining us today. Uh, and welcome to our Kelsk Aquaculture Education Webinar. Uh, we've been running this quarterly series since about 2018, and today we're really happy to have one of our own, uh, Brianna Shaughnessy, who is our canal, one of our Canals Marine Policy Fellows in our office, NOAA's Office of Education. Uh, she'll be talking to us today about how we're convening a community of practice to strengthen aquaculture education. I'm Maggie Allen, I'm facilitating today's webinar, and I'm an Education and Grant Specialist for NOAA's, of, uh, NOAA's Office of Education. All right, so um, of course we have to go through a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, I'm sure many of you are very used to virtual uh, meetings at, by this time, but I know Adobe is a relatively new, some, you know, maybe not as frequently used um, as others, so um, hopefully everything will be smooth. Um, but if you are having technical difficulties, we do recommend um, opening Adobe Connect via the application instead of the browser. Uh, it should have popped up around the time you clicked the link um, asking you to choose. And so when you download the app, it, it tends to work a bit better. Um, so if you are having problems right now, but you can still hear me saying this, um, you might want to just exit out and rejoin via the application. And same goes um, with how you, if you're having sound issues, sometimes calling in via telephone might work a little better than listening through um, the, the platform. So if you can hear me say this, but you're maybe having some sound issues, we recommend maybe dialing back into that toll-free conference number listed in that slide. So of course, if everything's working fine, no matter how you've joined us today, you can just disregard that, but sometimes we found that those ways um, have been a little less problematic. So of course, no matter how you're listening to us today, um, please mute your speaker in Adobe Connect. So that's graying out the green microphone above if you've called in the Adobe, the Adobe app. And of course, if you're on your phone, please um, mute your speaker on your phone. And, um, and during the presentation, please type any questions you might have into the chat box and Brianna will answer them after her presentation. You're also free to unmute yourself and raise your hand um, during the Q&A uh, so you can ask the question out loud. And I've seen a couple of people have been experimenting with the raise your hand function. So that's the little person up there on the top with a, with a raised hand. So um, if you'd like to speak up at any point, just raise your hand. Um, and then of course, there's a bunch of other options there as well. Um, if you're having any, you know, if you wanting to speak louder or anything like that. Um, and lastly, this webinar will be recorded. So if you'd like to listen to this again at the end, if you missed some of it or you want to share it with any of your colleagues, we will be sending out a recording about 24 hours after this, and it will also be on our website as well. All right, so we know some of you are part of this network, and some of you have listened to a couple of webinars in the past, so apologies, this may be a bit repetitive. But for those of you who are new to us today, I just wanted to give a quick background about who the host is of this webinar. Uh, so the Coastal Ecosystem Learning Center Network, or the KELP Network, is a partnership of 25 aquariums that are across North America, and our office, NOAA's Office of Education, coordinates this network, and together we work together to engage the public in protecting marine and coastal ecosystems. And one part of this network is we've had an aquaculture initiative for the last few years, and uh, similar to the overall goal of the KELP Network, the goal of the aquaculture initiative is to better connect NOAA resources and experts uh, with aquariums so that they can engage their visitors on the science of sustainable aquaculture. And this webinar series is one of many activities that this initiative has um, so that we can meet that goal. And Brianna will get into that later with the webinar today. Um, so if you have any more questions about the, web, about the network or the initiative after today, um, you can please contact either me or Brianna if you'd like to learn more or be added to one of the listservs. All right, and so with that, um, I'm really happy again to introduce Brianna Shaughnessy, who is going to talk to us today about how we're hatching a plan for aquaculture education uh, and con by convening a community of practice. So she's going to um, tell us about the results of a NOAA-wide aquaculture education inventory survey, 
and how these results are being used to understand gaps and opportunities in our efforts and form an upcoming workshop and develop a mini grants opportunity. So Brianna is a 2020 Canals Marine Policy Fellow and NOAA's Aquaculture Education Coordinator. She's supported through the National Sea Grant Office, Office of Aquaculture, and the Office of Education. Brianna is a graduate of Northeastern University's 3Cs Master's Program in Marine Biology, where she studied eelgrass community ecology. She's currently a PhD candidate in environmental biology at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where she's studying seagrass farming expansion in New England. And Brianna was raised on Cape Cod, and her research where um, Brianna was raised on Cape Cod, and her research focuses on the development of sustainable aquaculture practices. And her long-term goal is to act as a li liaison between the community that raised her and the scientists and policymakers working to understand and promote sustainable aquaculture. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing, and uh, I'm going to be quiet now, and you can take it away, Brianna. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Maggie. I'm just going to share my presentation. Awesome. So. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm really excited to share some of the work that we've been doing um, this year and how it connects to some of the longer term aquaculture education efforts within the agency. Um, just to give you an idea of what you're up for, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the unique challenges preventing aquaculture from gaining um, public acceptance more broadly. Um, I'll talk about how education and public outreach efforts can kind of combat those challenges. Um, I'll give a little bit of background and rationale on our initiative and um, our work building an aquaculture education community of practice. Um, I'll give a little bit of an update on our efforts thus far, and then we'll go over some lessons learned and next steps. So I'm here today by way of Jarrett Burns Lab at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where I'm an environmental biology PhD candidate. Um, through my work with the Burns Lab and through a two-year transdisciplinary NSF fellowship, uh, my dissertation really shaped into this collaboration between my formal training as a kelp forest ecologist and my upbringing on Cape Cod. Um, my research now focuses on the sustainable growth of seaweed farming in New England, um, but I'm here today to talk about my Knaus Fellowship as well, Aquaculture Education Coordinator. Um, just a reminder, if you're a joining us report. right now to uh, mute your, your speakers, um, thank you. Um, so the Sea Grant, or sorry, the Canals Fellowship is um, driven by the Sea Grant, the National Sea Grant Office. Um, it matches qualified graduate students with hosts in the legislative and executive branches of the government, and those graduate students gain experience in ocean, coastal, and Great Lakes resources and they learn about the national policy decisions that affect those resources. Um, so this year I'm sponsored by MIT Sea Grant as their 2020 Canals Fellow, um, and it ended up being really the perfect year for uh, me to join the Canals uh, cohort. Um, the National Sea Grant Office, Office of Aquaculture, and Office of Education came together this year to host the first ever joint fellow in aquaculture education. So on the left side of these photos here, we really have the core team that's been um, hosting and mentoring me this year. Um, Brooke Carney, Christos Nikolopoulos, uh, Cindy Sandoval, and Mark Rath um, are all kind of my core steering group that um, have taken me on to mentor me and guide me through this project. Uh, Maggie Allen has been helping us out all, all along the way. Um, and together, we put together this kind of steering committee to represent kind of a diversity of expertise uh, and experiences across the agency in order to make sure that our efforts are really driven by the diversity of perspectives that are involved in aquaculture work um, at NOAA. So we have Linda Chilton, uh, Ken Riley, and Chris Galachi who represent our um, kind of diversity in those efforts as we have put together some of the work that we've been doing this year. So um, the United States has been uh, working to foster sustainable aquaculture practices over the past 30 years. Uh, sustainable aquaculture must meet NOAA's triple bottom line of environmental, economic, and social sustainability. So one piece of tackling this sustainability puzzle is to build a deep understanding of and also successfully address some gaps in educational efforts that can be roadblocks to public understanding of aquaculture as a topic. 
Um, NOAA as an agency is committed to tapping into this power of public understanding by monitoring these knowledge gaps and using best practices to address the diversity of aud audiences that have a stake in aquaculture that you can see here. Now, aquaculture involves some complex issues. Just to name a few, we have regional variations. We have the use of public spaces for commercial development. We have uh, environmental impacts, such as the exploitation of natural resources. We have industrialized farming, animal welfare. Um, in addition to this, aquaculture practices themselves vary widely across regions and across farm species. Uh, fin fish, shellfish, and seaweed are our key players here. But even within those sectors, there are vastly different approaches to harvesting and gear technology for those species. Um, scallops, for example, can swim. So the gear that's required to farm those shellfish is much different than the gear that would be required to farm mussels, which can kind of grow happily on a rope until they're large enough to eat. So as you can see, these are multidimensional complex issues in their own right. Uh, the public is challenged with all of them when they're deciding their level of support for aquaculture within their community. And because aquaculture means so many different things, um, the public is essentially expected to do its own research in determining their stance on different aquaculture products. And this can lead to the spreading of confusing information. And um, when we're faced with too many complex issues and choices, we often stick to what we know. Um, and this is something that psychologist Barry Schwartz has studied extensively and labeled the paradox of choice. Um, and having these complex, complicated topics make increasing public support more challenging. And if we're going to avoid this paradox of choice, you can start to see how we need to unpack each issue, both as it relates to aquaculture and as it relates to specific regions and specific communities. And if you take that even a step further, it's also important to share approaches and challenges and successes among regions in order to build a robust national approach. Now, many before us have successfully tackled these complex and transdisciplinary issues by connecting and factoring the diversity of learners into learning experiences. Uh, networks have been built to effectively communicate topics like climate change, ocean acidification, and marine debris, among others. Um, all along the way, NOAA has been supporting and collaborating on these efforts as a trusted source of information um, when it comes to these complex topics. And uh, these partnerships, like the one that you see here um, and that you might be a part of, are key in ensuring that our science at NOAA and our guidance and resources can be really leveraged to the best of their potential and shared effectively with the public. Um, and we want that for aquaculture too. We want to ensure that the research advancements and the big achievements in sustainably expanding domestic aquaculture reach our diversity of public audiences, um, like those millions of visitors that our aquarium partners serve each year. Um, and building on this importance of partnerships, I'm, I'm just gonna take a turn for a moment to talk about how creating these networks has really helped combat this public confusion surrounding complex environmental topics. So I could fill an entire semester long class with the exemplary efforts that environmental educators have used to tap into unique community perspectives and craft engagement opportunities on complex topics. Uh, if you are a Kelk member here today, then you had the chance to hear about one approach that um, is an exciting new publication that's right out of our Office of Education. Um, it was a collaborative effort through uh, Carrie McDougall, Sarah Schettinger, and Jeannie Bay, among others. Um, if you're interested in these topics at the end of the webinar, I highly suggest that you check out this publication. Um, you can find it at the, top in the, at the website on the top right of this slide. Um, briefly though, uh, if you're looking to change the behavior of a community uh, and build resilience within that community, it's not effective to just go into the community and tell them how they need to approach things. Um, if we take recycling as an example, uh, one of one community's efforts in recycling can really make a huge impact, but in order for a community to properly recycle, there needs to be more than just an understanding that recycling is a good thing. Uh, in order to truly shift to environmentally responsible long-term behaviors, we first need to understand the knowledge that's held within that community 
um, also where it comes from and strategies that work best for that community to enhance citizen engagement. Um, this both lends to and is influenced by the disposition of members of that community towards recycling, um, which can affect the motivation of the members to kind of buy into those efforts. Moving further, the knowledge and disposition are interconnected with the skills within that community. Skills can be the ability to ask relevant questions like, where is my recycling going? What bins are needed? As well as the ability to create and evaluate plans as is issues arise. Um, and all of this leads to the communi community's ever-evolving behavior. Uh, whether or not the community recycles and believes in recycling um, as an environmentally friendly habit and understands how to properly recycle is all impacted by all of these puzzle pieces, including the personal, social, and physical relationships that community has with it, with, within itself um, and that the community has with this complex issue and how they are, are engaged in tackling it. But um, building this change within the community, you, you can kind of build this deeper sense of connection across community members. And in doing so, you can build resilience within that group and start to gain this change in behavior that might help the community longer term if you can tap into all of these different aspects of how the community relates to the problem. Um, now, this theory of change literature, I just simplified it uh, quite a bit, but it really creates this guidebook from which to understand on a theoretical level how to effectively implement engagement plans within a community. Um, another important layer uh, within this are the networks through which best practices are learned and programs can be developed. Uh, one of those programs and one example is the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation, the NOKI Network. Uh, since 2009, NOKI has been a collaborative effort to raise the discourse around climate change and ocean acidification. Now, the goal here is to disseminate research through a science communication lens, and in doing so, NOKI members are able to shift the conversation and inspire action by discussing specific solutions that are unique to the communities that they're working with. Uh, so this is really tapping into the importance of this community lens through which to educate the public in ways that really meet them where their needs are. Noki members' ability to communicate effectively and deliberately with these diverse audiences um, really contributes to a better understanding of climate change among the people that they talk to. And in turn, these people are more likely to take action um, and, and try to solve climate change problems and also be attentive to messages of climate change solutions. Um, and this is achieved by, in part, by equipping educators and scientists with four tools to bring their messages to the public. And those tools include um, knowledge about climate change science and topics uh, effective communication techniques through which to share that knowledge, uh, a supported community of NOKI members that they can turn to if they run into any problems or have any successes that they want to share, and uh, confidence that they can actually do this difficult work. And these tools and networks don't just kind of appear by willpower overnight. They really co require consistent reassessment and collaborative conversations. Uh, this is the framework that NOKI works off of with their educators as they build their programs. Um, many of you may be familiar with the NOKI network because it's largely driven by aquarium partnerships. And these programs have found great success by connecting often to share experiences, share resources, um, build their own collaborative community with their aquarium and other partners. And for one example, um, they have found great success in creating infographics that cater uh, very directly and very specifically to certain communities. And we believe that working off of these networks and building these exemplary models will really help us tackle the complexities that surround aquaculture topics and aquaculture perceptions. So to circle it back to aquaculture education, uh, these exemplary efforts like the NOKI network are truly parallel to how we can approach engaging the public on complex aquaculture topics. But um, these are challenging conversations. Um, all food production has its challenges and its benefits, and we're not here to magically fix those. Um, we're here to find really common ground. And 
Most of us agree on a large majority of these topics. We want a healthy planet, we want sustainable seafood, and we want that sustainable seafood to be available for our future generations. But um, there are some environmental NGOs, fishing industry groups, and others that are vocal detractors. Um, these folks have strong voices and effective lobbying. Um, and it is this small portion of these conversations where we don't communicate that will push people out of the conversation and keep them from helping it move forward. Um, NOAA as an agency is in an interesting position, kind of sitting at the middle of these conflicting groups. Uh, we do aim to provide unbiased information to each, but what we really need to do is engage both of these sides with the public to have honest discussions. Um, and these discussions can focus on the latest advances and challenges that uh, need to be resolved, uh, but they really should be driven by community specific facts and community specific needs. Um, and we aim to do this by leveraging the existing trust that NOAA and our aquarium partners have built over the years with stakeholders and with the public uh, in order to find neutral ground for discussing aquaculture um, both locally, nationally, and at a global level. Um, and this is really where the community of practice comes into play. So by creating this group of educators that are supported and provided with clear communication tools and techniques, we hope that we can leverage resources, share best practices, and discuss lessons learned in order to ensure that credible and consistent messaging is distributed to our partners. Um, and the goal in doing this is to really improve the public's sense of understanding of what aquaculture is within their community, uh, whether or not it's a sustainable product for them within their community, and also allow folks to kind of take ownership of their aquaculture product decisions. So how are we going to build this community of confident aquaculture education collaborators? Uh, for those of you that are attending from outside of the KELP network today, uh, the Office of Education first got involved with aquaculture education back in 2017 as a KELP priority. Um, in order to ensure that our KELP Aquarium partners were provided with the best available information and expertise, uh, Christos and Maggie Allen reached out to our NOAA colleagues that focus on aquaculture. Uh, they were in the Office of Aquaculture Sea Grant Office and the National Centers for Coastal and Ocean Science. Uh, and with the help of these NOAA aquaculture folks, such as James Morris, Je Jess Beck, and Cindy Sandoval, um, Maggie Allen helped connect kelp with NOAA's aquaculture folks um, using efforts such as this webinar <laughs> series uh, that served really as the foundation of our efforts today. Um, and we made some really great progress in building capacity among our aquarium partners and connecting them with NOAA aquaculture resources and personnel. And that kind of led to Cindy Sandoval's idea to jointly support a Knauss Fellow um, this year in 2020 to build on the aquaculture efforts within kelp and start to coordinate these education activities across our agency. Um, and then came me. Um, and I really was floored when I saw the Knauss position description because it was an exact match for my background and interests. And, I just want to take a second to thank again the Office of Education, Office of Aquaculture, and National Sea Grant Office for their support, both financial and in hosting and mentoring me throughout this year. So thank you, Cindy, Brooke, Christos, and Mark for making this happen. Um, but what is it that we have been doing to reach our goal of coordinating efforts, um, and how are we going about that? So our our first step was really to define the pro problem that we wanted to tackle and also to develop an understanding of what was going on at the NOAA agency level that we could, you know, resources that we could leverage. Um, and I wanted to share kind of this backbone of this NOAA-wide effort and our rationale in getting here to uh, eventually share our plan moving forward. Um, so there's a lot going on here and I'm gonna just take a second to walk through it. Um, we have our multidimensional problem uh, as I mentioned, we have high variability in what aquaculture means under different circumstances and in different regions. Um, we don't really have a pipeline for credible and up-to-date information for the public, and there isn't much of an existing effort to coordinate NOAA's resources um, and use education as a strategy to combat this issue and create a pipeline. So our idea is that by convening and supporting a NOAA aquaculture education community of practice, 
we can ensure that the agency is collaborating to share the best resources available with folks like our aquarium and industry partners in order for them to be able to educate their public audiences. And in doing so, we support aquaculture expansion by creating able and competent educators who in turn create informed consumers. And we're kind of tackling all of this through an angle of aquaculture literacy or enhancing the public's general understanding of what aquaculture means. Um, and our approach here is to use education as a tool for enhancing aquaculture literacy. Uh, and this doesn't come without assumptions. Um, the assumption is that uh, NOAA and its aquarium and industry partners are willing and able to participate um, in some collaborative activities that we've put together which include a workshop and some mini grants opportunities that um, help foster these connections that we're talking about. Uh, now, COVID-19 has really thrown us all for a loop, to put it very lightly. Uh, we're closely monitoring the impacts of the pandemic on our aquarium and industry partners, and we're really um, kind of adjusting and, and developing our mini grants opportunity um, in a way that both can support them and also aligns with their capacity at this time. So prior to this workshop and mini grants opportunity, uh, we started with a NOAA wide inventory survey to do what I mentioned before, which was really understand what was happening at the NOAA agency level. Um, that survey went out this past March and we collected 74 responses across NOAA line offices and programs. Um, I know a lot of you were in the webinar that we dove kind of deeply into the results for this survey, but um, and there is a recording of that webinar online that I'm happy to share uh, if you reach out to me directly, but I'm gonna give the broad strokes here just as a reminder. Um, most of our responses came from our Sea Grant network, which makes sense because they're our largest network within the family. Um, we had quite a few responses from our fisheries colleagues uh, and our other category represents some folks from the National Ocean Service, from our NEARS network, from our VWET um, grantees and other such programs. We offered survey participants the opportunity to identify up to three gaps in NOAA's existing aquaculture education efforts. And from these gaps, we took a look at the 104 total responses and we made them a bit more digestible by binning them into grouped themes that you see here. Uh, and as you see here, the messaging theme was our largest group of gaps responses. Um, just to give you an idea of how we pulled out responses for this group, uh, this was any call for training on providing messaging to the public or to different stakeholder groups, um, more regional and species specific messaging, and balanced or transparent messaging that acknowledges the pros and cons of different types of aquaculture. Now within the messaging category, most of the responses fell within um, these kind of regionally specific content um, categories and the agreed upon common messaging categories. And I'll give you a, just a second to uh, read some of those responses here. Now, a smaller percentage of those responses fell within um, kind of balanced messaging or messaging that acknowledges both the pros and cons of aquaculture. Um, there were also some calls for kind of direct homeowner or property outreach uh, and updates to existing information. And you can kind of start to see how these build on each other and many of them are kind of interconnected. Our uh, second most popular uh, gap that was identified by our respondents was um, sharing resources. Uh, this category really kind of focused in on the idea that uh, we need to tap into these accessibility issues and uh, help folks be aware that these resources even exist. Um, any resources that have to do with aquaculture that might help the public understand different aquaculture topics um, this kind of taps into the, the pipeline of information that's needed in order to get kind of uh, folks aware of what information is out there. Um, responses also called for taking those resources and connecting them more deliberately across NOAA line offices. So many of us work in different capacities with different audiences 
and um, connecting best practices for each of those audiences across the agency is another thing that folks called for. And something, you know, this is a problem that I even came across when creating this webinar. Um, this infographic that I used at the beginning is really awesome. It shows all the different types of aquaculture and the ways that the working waterfront can be um, super diverse. But I didn't know that this uh, infographic from the National Ocean Service existed until I kind of Googled uh, aquaculture infographics the other day. So I think this really gets at how there are so many great resources out there that deserve more recognition, um, but we need a more direct pipeline in which to do so. So there were a ton of gaps identified here, 104 to be exact, uh, a lot of great information and information that's helpful, not just to us in our efforts, but also to other folks across NOAA and uh, other NOAA partners. Um, but we can't possibly tackle all of this in one year. And we need to acknowledge that certain efforts are in the wheelhouse of this effort in particular, and others aren't quite in there. And what we can do is uh, find some overlap across NOAA offices and start to tackle some of those common gaps with our efforts moving forward um, in things like our problem statements for our mini grants opportunity and the discussions that we have at some of our workshops. And our first workshop actually happened a few weeks ago. Um, the goal of this workshop was really to help us understand who within the agency might be engaged in aquaculture education um, efforts and also might be interested in engaging in our community of practice moving forward. Um, we uh, convened virtually on September 22nd to allow these NOAA folks that might not normally have the chance to connect um, an opportunity to kind of get to know each other and get to know each other's names and kind of connect across the agency. Um, and we broke out also into some regional discussions to talk about some of the broader topics surrounding aquaculture in those regions. Um, one of the upsides of our virtual reality is that folks can kind of join from the comfort of their own region. At one point, we had about 62 people on the line, which uh, was great. Uh, this was initially meant to be kind of a small in-person workshop, but it was really great to see so many eager faces from such a diverse background of knowledge and expertise across NOAA. And it also gave me a chance to shamelessly use my pets as an icebreaker. Um, we learned a lot of great lessons from this workshop day. Um, convening through a virtual space during this workshop, uh, you know, created its own challenges, but some of the key takeaways um, and common threads that came out of the discussions that happened, um, there could always be more time for discussions, which is great. Um, we want to continue this discussion longer term. Um, many public misconceptions and misperceptions seem to stem from this diversity of meanings of the word aquaculture. Um, and this is really perpetuated by this lack of credible organized um, information through which to, or, or a pipeline through which to gather information about aquaculture topics. Um, career awareness came out as a key gap. Uh, aquaculture presents a great uh, opportunity for STEM engagement in STEM careers. Um, it's a great, um, a uh, career for folks that might not want a desk job, but might not also want to work in a lab. Uh, it provides an opportunity to really get out and um, work within the environment. Um, and educating youth on these opportunities um, is a really important uh, gap that was kind of identified by many regions. Um, another gap was uh, one size fits all is not going to work in our messaging and understanding of the community level needs and clearly defined target audiences for educational efforts are really crucial to the effectiveness of communication techniques, as we learned kind of with the Noki network and other networks that have worked on these techniques um, in the past. Uh, and the need to tackle this idea that aquaculture products threaten commercial fisheries and tourism and might not be as healthy as wild caught products is um, one of the, the misconceptions and misperceptions that seem to be um, kind of common across uh, at a national level. Um, we discussed how a successful community of practice can, uh, will need to connect across disciplines, connect often and share resources and best practices. Um, and as that last common thread indicates, uh, this is a long-term effort that will take time and multiple meetings, but again, 
we're invested in positioning NOAA as a credible source of information and a means through which to find um, that information, much in the way that we have been for ocean acidification and other climate related research in the past. So there are tons of great efforts across all of these partners. If you attended um, our last Kelk webinar, you heard about the Eat Seafood America cap campaign. Um, many aquariums are already participating in conversations about aquaculture um, and not just aquariums. You know, NOAA Fisheries has some great resources in a video gallery on their webpage. Um, sea Grant has been supporting the Great Lakes Aquaculture Collaborative Network. Um, which is a big push to coordinate across the Great Lakes region. Um, Aquarium of the Pacific has their Seafood for the Future exhibit. Uh, farmers themselves have their own detailed websites about their farms and what goes on on their farms. And even the Agricultural Society has a website about careers in aquaculture. But the question here remains, how do we start to connect these efforts? Um, and how can we invest in building capacity for having conversations across these groups um, and make, you know, not just connections, but also um, a list of best practices and a community through which to share those. Um, if we can start to fit these puzzle pieces together so that they're not such siloed efforts, but rather a network of efforts, we can learn from each other and kind of distribute the burden as we tackle this complex topic moving forward. Um, and now that we sparked the conversation across NOAA with our first uh, workshop, we're ready to connect with our aquarium and industry partners to kind of chart our course forward. And the next opportunity for this uh, and opportunity to engage will be our November workshop series, uh, which will be open to Kelk members. Um, this series will convene again virtually on November 18th uh, through November 20th. Uh, and we'll discuss defining aquaculture education and its audiences. Um, designing a community of practice, and we'll do a bit of matchmaking for our mini grants opportunities, which are set to roll out in early 2021. Um, for Kelk members to register, you can contact me directly. Um, and if I've made my case well enough today, then you'll hopefully be excited to do so. Um, but again, this is really the beginning of a longer term effort that requires connecting consistently across disciplines moving forward. And um, we hope that we can use the best practices of those before us to ensure that NOAA can truly play a part as a source of credible up-to-date resources um, that are able to advance aquaculture education conversations moving forward. So um, with that, um, thank you all for attending. Um, I will take some questions if you have them and please feel free to reach out to me uh, if you'd like that webinar recording or any other resources I mentioned today. Thank you so much, Brianna. Looks like we have some questions coming in already. Um, I'll just read them to you. Um, so Sam Chan asked, um, he also he said, aquaculture infographic displayed is richly informative. Depending on the audience, the term resilience might not be immediately intuitive on the benefits of aquaculture to museum guests who are seafood consumers. Do you think resilience might need further illustration? Yeah, I think like aquaculture, resilience has a lot of different meanings to a lot of different audiences. Um, you know, you can talk about resilience through the lens of the theory of change uh, uh, publication that just came out, or you can talk about it kind of on a more um, physically resilient level. I think, uh, Sam, you bring up a good point of kind of uh, identifying the terms within each uh, infographic or educational pamphlet or program and really kind of defining what those terms mean. Um, keeping in mind the audiences that might be interpreting those terms. And again, if you want to ask questions, you're happy, you're welcome to um, type it in the chat box or else you're also, um, you can raise your hand by clicking on that little person up there on the top of your screen and uh, you can ask the question out loud. And Tanoya and Sam said, said thank you. Hi, Tanoya, and you're welcome, Sam. <laughs> Christos, I see you raised your yeah. hand. <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Brianna. This is Christos. Great job. Uh, you mentioned that CELC members can attend the November workshop. Who else can attend the November workshop? So our November workshop is open to our NOAA colleagues, and uh, many of them attended our first workshop, and we hope to see you again at our second workshop series. Um, we also are opening this workshop up um, beyond our CELC members to our industry partners. So um, on my end, I have a couple of folks that I collaborated with. I collaborate with in New England on my dissertation research that um, will be joining that workshop. And if you know anyone um, that, it, or if you are someone that's interested from the industry angle um, in participating in, you know, these talks about aquaculture education, um, we're all ears. So uh, you can reach out directly to me in order to register. And other grants. Um, and I did want to note that. I, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, if you are a grad student uh, connected to a C grant um, program, then I think that would probably be the most um, relevant uh, group of folks to uh, join us at that workshop. Um, and then Gabrielle, I'm relying on you to help. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, and I did want to note that um, Brown has referenced the, our theory of change for resilience education a couple times. Um, it's in our slides, but I also just put it in the chat box. Um, it's a really great resource for community resilience. Um, and then Sam just asked, uh, how are growers in the industry engaged? Any cool insights from them on the message they wish to convey? Um, that's a great question, Sam, and we're hoping to get some insights from them at our next workshop. Um, on some of the different audiences that they might interact with on their farms. Uh, I can say from personal conversations, um, the farmers that I work with in New England are really interested in some messaging that they can provide and a toolkit of ways to um, a, you know, provide messaging about their farms that um, doesn't cause them to have to like go down a research rabbit hole when they're trying to to look into some of the environmental impacts and things that folks ask about when they visit their farms. Uh, so we're hoping to kind of build that angle into our workshop discussions, as well as uh, how we can kind of use this, uh, you know, many, many farmers are, are these small scale efforts where their farms themselves are experiments, right? Um, so using kind of that wealth of knowledge about the environment that exists within the farmers is one thing that uh, we hope to tap into. I saw someone, a couple people typing, so give me a second. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Matt Thompson just said, uh, with 90% of U.S. seafood consumption coming from abroad and major contributions from aquaculture like shrimp, will the proposed aquaculture education address non-domestic aquaculture? I think so through the lens of how it connects to um, domestic aquaculture topics, I think it's completely relevant to bring in information about what's happening globally. but. Um, since we're starting this effort and building it from the ground up, I think we're focusing on uh, domestically the regions, um, you know, New England, West Coast, uh, Alaska, Pacific Islands, Southeast Gulf areas, and trying to coordinate these kind of regional level needs and community level perspectives uh, in order to kind of combined together to create a more national approach. And then, then we might be ready to take it international after that. But um, for now, we're, we're pretty focused on the domestic area. Brianna, I have a quick question for you. Um, how do you see like social science research, especially like maybe perception research playing into how uh, you know, these educators may design their exhibits and programs since it's so different across the U U.S. and, and the world. And that. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, this is really kind of a, a social science heavy um, topic that we're trying to tackle here, right? Um, in order to effectively reach certain folks, then we need to kind of meet them where they're at and, and the needs that different audiences have in order to effectively uh, kind of make the information stick. So in order to create exciting programs and to create exhibits that reach wider audiences, I think we need to take this social science um, perspective on things and really think about, um, you know, incorporating people's perspectives into the, the um, products that we make. It's also a great opportunity to connect folks on a kind of more intimate level across communities. Um, aquaculture really provides an opportunity to get outside um, during a time where we're kind of all stuck inside. You can um, kind of start to see the, the connection to the environment when you start to visit the farm. So um, tapping into that is really important. Yeah, and I think um, Mackenzie Nelson asked us a question. I think it was just sent to us. So um, will you be doing formal message testing to develop these messages and products? So that's something that we would hand, or I guess hand over to our mini grant project uh, proposals. So um, I'm here to coordinate folks and you know provide platforms through which to engage formally and informally in discussions. Um, our mini grant opportunities are really looking for um, high risk, high reward projects that um, might, you know, think outside the box a little bit from traditional um, aquaculture messaging initiatives. And uh, those are things that we would hope that you would build into the, the project proposal. Um, as I mentioned, those uh, that mini grants opportunity will roll out early 2021. And we're kind of working right now to adapt to COVID with that and um, hoping to highly encourage, if not require, Kelk partnerships in those. But again, we're we're working with our Kelk members in order to understand their capacity to engage in those opportunities. Mm -hmm. A couple of people typing earlier, so I want to make sure everyone has a chance to ask questions. Well, I can ask one more question too while we're waiting. Um, going off of my original question about social science and everything, um, I'm also curious about how maybe education and improving, you know, perception of all culture is related to social justice and social equity and addressing these kind of social concerns about aquaculture um, mm -hmm. that maybe go beyond a simple exhibit, um, but you know, that are these key concerns in certain areas where it is, you know, addressing such issues like access and um, you know, marine resource tenure and things like that. Mm -hmm. So these are, again, um, topics that I think would really uh, benefit from a small group of folks kind of brainstorming ways in which to combat those issues. Um, I think that uh, aquaculture presents a, a, a unique but also an old challenge. Um, aquaculture is something that's been going on for centuries and centuries um, and is something that has really ingrained some, some traditional knowledge into it. However, the traditional knowledge isn't always highlighted as um, the source of expert knowledge for, um, you know, creating programming and messaging. So I think it's really important to keep these things in mind and to start, you know, from this community level and look at all of the different perspectives that are involved and make sure those perspectives are part of the conversation um, and if not just addressed moving forward. Um, so things like that are things that I think uh, need to be brought up even though they're complex discussions, uh, they need to be brought up often and continuously revisited.
All right, then we have a question from Tara Mays. Um, great presentation, thank you. What kind of engagement and opportunities do you have in the pipeline for educating kids and students about the opportunities for careers in the aquaculture industry, especially specifically in the US, where the aquaculture industry is still pretty small? Mm -hmm. So this is something that uh, we've identified as a gap uh, kind of recently that we need to work on. You know, uh, there's a couple of different angles to this, right? There's the workforce development angle where it's more um, folks, uh, entrepreneurial folks or folks that are looking to enter a career in aquaculture. And then there's also this kind of STEM engagement and career awareness level that uh, taps into uh, educating youth you know, earlier on about aquaculture and the careers that are available to them in aquaculture. Um, I think that uh, it, many of us know that aquaculture is an up and coming topic, if not, it's already up and come in the United States. Uh, it's something that is going to provide a lot of jobs moving forward um, in, in, in addition to feeding hopefully a lot of folks that um, might need you know, access to alternative sources of protein from meat. Um, these are things that uh, we do not have a clear pipeline on right now. However, I can name you know, a handful of programs and uh, formal K through 12 uh, initiatives that you know, do things such as aquaculture in action, which brings aquaponics um, equipment into schools themselves for kids to, to uh, create their own closed circuit uh, systems. Um, these are skills that we should start to build into some STEM engagement opportunities so that kids are aware um, as they decide, you know, what career paths they want to go on, um, what different opportunities aquaculture provides. So um, you tapped into kind of a need that we've assessed and something that we um, hope to talk about uh, in our workshops moving forward. Thanks, Tara. We might have a couple more <laughs> things, so. <laughs> I'm not sure if they'll pop up. <laughs> I saw multiple people typing. Oh, they're still typing. All right. <laughs> there we go. So, uh, Sam <laughs> asked, what is the Canal Fellowship like? Okay. And another switching direction. That's a great like question. Like <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I am coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts. I recently relocated to my home state uh, to be a bit closer to family during all of this. Um, it has been an interesting year, and I will just say that I am incredibly lucky for being in the office that I ended up with um, and with the colleagues that and the support system really that I ended up with. Um, it's been uh, it's been interesting, just like it's been interesting for everyone else. So um, yes, my computer, my tiny little laptop has become everything. <laughs> All right, so uh, Elliot Nelson said, I know this project is focused on NOAA and our partners, but how might this inter initiative interface with extension and landlocked states, like in the different <laughs> USDA regional aquaculture centers? Oh, no, worries. no worries, Elliot. I'm distracted by stampeding children right outside my window. I don't know if everyone's been able to hear them. Um, so we are, you know, we have quite a few extension specialists that are engaged in uh, some of these conversations. We would love to kind of pinpoint and reel in some more Great Lakes folks. Uh, and the Great Lakes Aquaculture Collaborative is, is one of the ways that we hope to do so. Um, I think in, so if we're, we're talking about the, the mini grants and the workshop discussion opportunities, I think these are things to bring up in, if, in the, the workshop discussions, um, different partners that might provide 
uh, different resources and expertise than you know NOAA itself or um, aquarium partners can provide, if that makes sense. So um, you, you mentioned the USDA regional aquaculture centers. I think they have um, kind of a different angle than the groups that we've identified um, previously to participate in this. And um, if there are folks that you can connect with that uh, you know you believe might or connect us with that you believe might have some some information, then please feel free to reach out with some contacts for us because um, landlocked is you know just as important as these coastal communities. Aquaculture happens there. And I personally worked in a sushi restaurant in Boulder, Colorado, um, and I know how much people like fish and, and seafood in that place. So uh, it doesn't just stop as you go inland. All right, we may have time for one more question. I did see maybe one more person typing, so I want to make sure everything's been answered. Um, so yeah, we have a few more minutes left for it. Five o'clock. Um, but I don't see anyone else typing, so maybe uh, Chris changed their mind about asking. But if you, you do want to ask Brianna questions, there's her email right there, and um, so you feel, please reach out to her. Um, and uh, like I said, you'll be getting the recording. Um, Tomorrow, hopefully, it will send out automatically. Um, if you don't get it, I will I will check to make sure everyone has it who is on this today and make sure everyone gets the recording. It will also be on our website as well. Um, so you can feel free to watch it later as well, again and share with your colleagues. And uh, this is a quarterly webinar series, so we'll hopefully have another one in January or so. Um, and again, all of these are open to the public and are typically focused on aquaculture education. So thanks everyone for joining and uh, we hope you have a good rest of your week and day. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye, thank you.